this session is uh, by Nedal Muglu, and we're going to hear a bit about uh, tensor algebra and quantum chemistry. So, uh, as mentioned, I'm Arda Muglu, I'm a postdoctoral research associate at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, and this, I will, today I will be talking about our generalized tensor algebra for uh, specifically quantum chemistry. Uh, I have been working on this with my colleagues from Shiram and Carol. And so tensor algebra is literally almost everywhere because it's the major component in machine learning and most of the scientific applications that use some kind of simulation. So today I will be focusing on like, quantum chemistry because this is mainly for uh, quantum chemistry project. And then we can act. So the tensor operations are usually like embedded into uh, mathematical formulas like this in a paper of this like quantum chemist paper. And then the users, the application writers has to like find these decipher these uh, methods and like write books that do the tensor operations over them. So there are a couple of like uh, examples that simplifies this construction of these uh, applications like uh, tensor contraction engine and more recently, uh, tensor algebra compiler is doing something like this. So it's basically a, a tensor operation over a uh, multi-dimensional array, and the representation is basically uh, simple mathematical formulas. But there are some limitations that uh, new scientific applications are facing uh, using these applications. One of them is the log sparse speed. So most of the new scientific applications are increasingly focusing on uh, like leveraging sparsity in the computation. So there is a need, uh, uh, important need for supporting this block sparsity in these tensor operations, uh, as well as some generalized tensor operations like uh, reductions where you have these uh, computations where you don't have the, uh, some indices in the uh, output where you do the sum over. For example, in this case, C of uh, ij will be equal to uh, A of ik and kj, B of kj, which is then the result will be some multiplication will be summed over k values and then assigned to c. Similarly, there are like examples of these kind of generalized uh, operations for broadcasting where you have an index on the output but which doesn't appear on the uh, uh, right hand side. And also batching where you have an index in all of the tensors uh, used in the operation. And there is also an important thing that most of the tensors, most of the computation now is uh, used uh, like uh, are dense, but the computation itself is sparse. So you have to have a support for having a sparse view of a dense tensor uh, so that you can uh, have an efficient implementation of some applications that uh, coming out today. So what's our contribution? So to like solve these uh, limitations, we propose a new tensor algebra formalism, which is basically composed of generic indexing, uh, indexing space representation, where you define uh, an index space for each dimension of a tensor, and then you can do some uh, optimization by tiling these indices, and which will uh, result in uh, uh, efficient computation in HPC systems, and then we support the uh, generic sparsity uh, for different kinds of sparsity, like compressed row, uh, sparse row format, or other ones. We demonstrated this formalism in, uh, in a couple of quantum chemistry applications, which I'm not the expert, so I won't go to, into details, but I will just mention about them. These are couple cluster methods, optimization over them, and then a couple of more sparse uh, uh, computations for quantum chemistry. <coughs> so let me dive into the formalism. So we have an index sequence formalism. Uh, it's basically a hierarchical structure of these index spaces that we use for constructing tensors. The first one is simple. It's uh, a positive integer set. It's basically you choose items from this set and construct a sequence. It can be, that can be repetition. This is mostly for kind of application specific. So I will not go like, give this example, but have a simple example where we have four elements for an index sequence which corresponds to a dimension of a tensor. Uh, the thing I talked about, you can tile these indices so that you have a more blocks of uh, data, like block uh, in tensors. So given a tile size, for example, for two, you will basically chop it into two parts and then the style index sequence basically will have two, uh, two indices that you can iterate over. And then, of course, if you do the tile size of unit tile size, you basically have the index sequence. It's the same as uh, having the index sequence. But we 
EU, like, I, I will demonstrate most of the application, most of the examples over unit tile, but in general, the applications have like tile sizes of bigger uh, tile sizes to have uh, per better performance on HPC systems. And for simplicity, I have labels, which is basically iterators over like loop. In, in a loop nest, you have iterators over some indices. In this case, for example, in this case, we have i, which will be iterating over uh, the set of 0, 1, 2, 3 uh, tiling indices. This is like a bit formal, so this will get more like, better understanding if I show some code. So for example here, the first two we basically construct a, a, an array, a, a tile index sequence, which basically have four elements in the first one, which is tile i1, and then the second one has like five elements. And the thing that you can also do a subset of these tile index sequences, for example, in the first one, we have a subset of first tile index space, which is basically the second like, second portion of it, plus two elements. And then for the other one, you have the first three elements of the second tile index sequence that we just constructed. This is the labels that I talked to you about. It's basically having a iterator uh, over these tile index sequences. And then we have the tensor construction. So in the end, when we have i, j, we have two-dimensional matrix, which corresponds to uh, one dimension corresponding to zero, four elements, and the other one is five. So when we assign something to this, basically we have four by five uh, matrices where we assign the value one. But then by using different labels that are like subset of things, we can assign a portion of it, slice of the tensor. Like in this case, we have k of j, which is basically as, uh, updating the second part of the uh, the whole tensor. Similarly, we, have, we can do like a more finer grain thing where we use K and L for updating the values. As you can see, this will just update the uh, uh, upper part of the uh, second dimension and the last part plus two elements of the first dimension, 21. So this is the general dance case. Uh, now I will go to, into details of the sparse representation. Uh, so the idea is very similar, but it's more challenging to formally uh, uh, like explain it. So I will go through an example to like, give the, the idea behind our formula. So dependent tile index sequences is basically a relation between uh, a set of indices to a, a subset of a tile index sequence. It's basically depending on how many dependencies you have, you have to have, for each indices you have a dependency uh, for a subset of the other one. So this will be explained better in the like, example. So assume that we have 4 by 5 matrix and then just the x values are non-zero, meaning the other parts are, uh, it's a sparse uh, tensor representation. So when you think about like, the compressed uh, sparse uh, row representation, you basically go for each uh, column and check which value doesn't, does have a non-zero value. So in this dependence, we basically say for, for i0, which is the first element of uh, i dimension, we have just two elements, which is the j1 and j4. Similarly, when we construct, go over all columns, we have a subset of the j values that we can iterate over in the end because they are the only non-zero ones. So basically, with this dependency map, you, you can construct something, a sparse tensor representation like this which has the A uh, of I, J, J of I. So it's basically, if you put a parenthesis between dependencies, so the J, the second dimension will be depending on the indices in the uh, index values for the first one. This is very uh, similar to compressed sparse row representation. You can all, always think, with, think this from the other perspective where you go over each row, for J0 you have I1 and I4, that's non-zero, and then you can do it for all, and then construct error dependency map, and in the end, you, you can represent the same tensor as this, where you have the dependency other way around, uh, from J to I, which represents the same sparse tensor. So, again, let me give some code examples. So, the first part is the same, we construct the tile index sequences, which is the full space, but then we represent the dependencies that we want to, this is basically the sparse pattern within a tensor that you want to uh, employ 
by constructing tensor or doing operations. So this is very similar to representing the uh, uh, dependence map as a map in C++. So for indice, index of uh, I0, we have 1 and 4 on the second uh, dimension. And similarly, we basically construct uh, subspaces out of the second dimension for the map here. And then we construct the dependency dependent tile index space, which is basically the, um, uh, the so in the end it is basically a TS, uh, TIS2, which is a subset of the, the second dimension, and we are depending on the third, like TIS1, which is the I, uh, and then we give the dependency map. Here, uh, the labels are like very dense labels, like independent labels, it spans over like 0 to 4, 3 and 0 to 4 for uh, I and J. And for J prime, it's very, a bit different because it's now a relation that depends on an I value. So when you are uh, writing the tensor uh, construction in the top here, you have the tensor A uh, I of J of I, which is basic J prime of I, which is basically the, giving the dependencies on what you are defining. Uh, and the second one is a dense uh, tensor construction. I will just use it for like, demonstrating some of the tensor operations. So, first of all, let's assign something to this sparse matrix. So, when you use this like dependent labels with like dependencies assigned, like this one, I O of J prime of I, you basically assign it to the sparsity pattern. You are using the sparsity pattern representing the J prime to assign values. As you can see, the matrix uh, is like updated just on the uh, sparsity patterns, the ones that are not empty. For the, currently it is like to visualize it, I put zeros there, but in the storage we will get rid of the zero values, so uh, we will also cut down the uh, data uh, usage for sparse tensors. Let's assign something to B, which is dense, and we just assign B a uh, one. So here I was talking like the, one of the limitations that I told you about is uh, the limitation that you cannot do operations on uh, dense cases like sparse computation. So in this case, you can basically use these dependent labels for uh, operating over dense matrix where you, have, you can assign uh, 42, like A. in this case, you are assigning A to B, but just the ones that are non-zero. Uh, uh, non non so in this case, you can see the update of B will only have 42 in the uh, portions of the tensor that are not non-empty for J prime. So this is one of the like uh, part to un understand. So if you have any questions about like sparsity and dependency, I will be happy to answer. Otherwise, I, I can go and talk about the, how these are actually constructed. Are you laying the array out contiguously, or yeah, I think you're representing it as a graph, right? Yes. Uh, in the, uh, it can be. It can be what uh, what you want. So it's basically I'm like abstracting out the storage, as long as I have the met metadata, I can always find the location. This, in, in this example, most of them are stored distributedly. So whenever I have an operation over a indices, I have the exact location where it is stored and I, I can get it. So the storage can be a linearized version of it, or you can uh, use, as long as there is a, uh, like, API that I can find the indices that I want to get from that uh, memory storage. And don't you find the representation as a graph as a layer of addressing? Yeah, it's kind of like that. So the metadata that I constructed with tiled index sequences that I bind to the tensors have that information so that whenever I iterate over things, which I will come to the loop next, I will find the location uh, in the storage and get, can get it for operating. So, the next thing I'll talk about, so, okay, this is a good interface that we have, and how is the loop nests are constructed for doing these operations. So, let me talk about, like, a dense case. So, this is a simple multiplication, uh, which has, like, four-dimensional and three-dimensional tensors. The loop nest is basically constructed out of a uh, default order. In this case, left-hand side indices, and then whatever left on the right-hand side, which is i, j, k, m, and n. So the loop we construct is basically will go over all values of i, j, k, m, and n, and 
and then do the computation and then assign it to A. And then in like for performance uh, reasons you, you, you might like end up uh, wanting another order, which in this case I say I am N coming first, later you will have J and K. So this is this can be basically if you uh, think that B is like distributed, it's not local, so you can basically with this loopness you can uh, get the uh, communicate with the other nodes, get the data, and then operate all, over the same values over and over again without needing to communicate again for getting the portions of B, different portions of B. So this is easy to do in like in dense case because even if you reorder the loopness, in, in the end the operation itself knows what to get and what to do. But in sparse uh, operations, it's the same operation, I just added some sparsity for J and K which are depending on the values of i. So the operation, the constructive loopness with default order is very similar, but the only difference, you can see that i comes first and then I will use that information for the indices, index values of i, for gathering the corresponding uh, dependence, like the uh, sequence that we will iterate over. So it's the same for j and it's the same for J and K because they both depend on I. So the loop order doesn't uh, break this uh, dependency that we have. So we have to have a uh, valid I value so that I can get the corresponding dependency, dependent uh, uh, sequence that I will iterate over for the other J and K. But in case of specialized loop orders, if you break the dependency, then the whole thing will break. Because we know that J and K is depending on the uh, I value and waiting for an I value to like, uh, find the corresponding iteration. But if the loop order breaks it, you have to do some magic to uh, reorder this label so that you can operate over these tensors. So there are, in the paper you can see that there are a couple, a couple of transformations on these dependent index sequences that you can intersect or project out some of the, uh, the dependencies and combine and invert so that you, you can have the reordering of this loop uh, so that you can write the loop of the uh, loopness. So I will mention uh, about a case study. This is hard to fork exchange using local density. I am not an expert. I couldn't like, even understand most of it. I tried to read the paper. It doesn't make any sense to me, but it is like that for most of the domain specific scientists as well because they have to, like these. Uh, equations are embedded somewhere that they have to decipher from the paper and try to come up with a, uh, like a sparsity pattern and then construct these computations themselves. So here they make use of a sparse patterns within the computation. So as you can see from the mathematical representation, there are some screening go going over mu, nu, and a. So it's basically very similar to what we have on dependent index sequence that I talked to you about. It's basically depending on i values, you are screening some of the new, new and a values for the computation itself. And the thing is that x and j, the input uh, tensors here are dense because they are computed as dense tensors, but then the operation itself is sparse. So the representation of it uh, in our uh, formulas is basically you construct index sequences, you then construct the tile index sequences. Uh, I forgot to tell, it doesn't have to be a single tile, so if you want to tile the, the whole index sequence differently, like 1, 3, 5, you can, as, as long as it like, splits the whole thing, it's about uh, tile size. And then you, you, have, you construct the dependency maps here, which is basically the sparsity patterns that uh, you are trying to uh, compute over, and then construct the dependence uh, tile sequences and later. So, most of this stuff, except this uh, box place, is just for context. Usually you don't have to write it over and over again. It's written once, the sparse pattern is set, and then you use the sparse pattern and the tile index sequences for constructing the uh, operations itself. You might try to have, like, you might also even use the same labels uh, if your uh, computation is always on the same uh, dimensions. And here, as you can see, the, the it looks very similar to what this is represented in mathematical uh, context. So it is kind of easier and more programmable for the application developers in the domain science 
application developers in sense. So the loop nest this construct uh, for this one is basically here the dependency is basically on i for a, mu, and mu. So we basically reorder things so that i will come first. And then using that i indices, we can have the corresponding dependencies depends for different uh, for a, mu, and mu values and then operate over them. As I said, you don't have to have the whole say, tile cycles things everywhere. You just basically use the, uh, this portion of the computation over and over again. If it's an iterative method, or you can basically combine it at a couple of more operations until you get the end result. So to, co to conclude, we present I presented a, like a new tensor algebra formalism that includes a generic indexing space representation along with sparse. Uh, sparse representation, uh, which allows you to write sparse tensor, like sparse tensor construction and uh, computation over uh, case with sparse uh, uh, sequences. And we have tiling over these dimensions so that we, we can uh, have a uh, efficient computation in HPC systems. And we demonstrated uh, the use of this in some quantum chemistry applications. And then, as a future work, we are now constructing the, like generalized loop nest for dependent like sparse cases. It's a bit harder than the dense case because you, as I told you about, we have to do transformation of them. And now it's almost done. We're still like struggling with it. But then we will like have the proof and everything ready, hopefully. Uh, the next thing is basically operational inco incompatible indices, which means until now I always talked about so a hierarchical view of the sequences, you basically have a full uh, space, a full sequence, and then you basically chop it up or use a portion of it. So there's always a hierarchical ordering between the root, like parent, parenting information that we can leverage for uh, efficient implementation. And the next thing is basically loop fusion. Uh, so you will, uh, you will create a loop for each, oper each tensor operation. But some of them might have a similar loop ordering or sim similar indices that it iterates over. So it will be very efficient to loop uh, fusion these kind of iterate loopness into just one single loop and uh, have the computation done more efficiently. With that, I would like, like to thank you. And if you have any questions, I will be to answer. Great, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Yes, afterwards. Um, uh, when you said that you do the let's say, on dense things, uh, if the size of the tile doesn't perfectly divide your, your index space, what do you do? Uh, I would keep, like, there will be different tile sizes. Like, if you tile a five uh, item to, into two, mm -hmm. the last one will be one. Now, your, your representation seeming does not... Is, do you have a separate uh, function for this? Because your representation seems to... So, uh, for like ease of representing, I just use oh, uh, simple ones, but we you can do this. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that you're doing sparse indexing over dense arrays. I, I assume you're not storing the zeros. Right? No. Uh, my second question is: I see you're at PMML. Are you working with Andrew Lumsden? Uh, not directly, but he's in our group. Uh, so, as I told, this is a DOE project. The, ECP project and the chemics. So there are like chemists allowed, uh, like involved. Most of the computer side is uh, on our side, is like with Shiram and Ajay making involved there. And I, yeah, I don't think you specified the, the language, the implementation. So the implementation is in C++. It's a C++ library. Right. And are you using MTL? Yes. And as a like, uh, distributed memory, we are using uh, local arrays, which is common. Mm -hmm. question here. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges with doing tensor contractions is that you have to pick the correct loop order because things will not fit into the memory otherwise. So is that something you consider as part of the generation of the loop nest? Yeah, that's basically, so there can be multiple optimizations on that. We are allowing a like, generic loop order structure that you can provide your own. But that's that for like if you're an application developer and you want to optimize for specific uh, hardware 
specific memory bandwidth and things like that. You can always, you can basically inject these constraints on the loop order so that it will perform better. So yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, as you mentioned, like it's one-to-one -one matching because we are closely working with the domain scientists, which helps a lot, and also it's a challenging thing because they have different views on how the computation and like they want to use Python. But then I think there is a kind of a like divergence on the uh, hardware as well. So <coughs> this kind of uh, like co-design I think will help at the end because domain scientists have a view, they want to it, it be done, but the hardware doesn't always support it. And uh, it's seen that DOE is having different uh, like exascale systems now, and they have different architectures, which will end up having different implementations on NVIDIA or AMD. So we are trying to like have this interface so that we can make quantum chemists happy. And then in the background, we will do lots of optimization for these kind of different architectures, different languages, you mentioned about the ML IR. We are also looking into that for using it as an intermediate representation of this kind of computation. Because the information you get from these operations that tell us, or like doing the uh, loop fusion and everything, so there can be multiple optimization chances uh, that we can have it be represented in an intermediate representation, and then from there do the optimization for specifically for different partners. So I think this is a good start to like start working with domain scientists which will be very important in the next five years for sure. It's, it's very pretty. It's, it's very nice. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Let's uh, thank you now again for this talk.